Let me just make sure we're recording. Test one, two. Excellent. Okay, I am here with my dear, dear friend, Ben Leroy, who is uh, my brother from another mother. That's right. Um, we have known each other, started corresponding, I guess, in 2002 or three, and Ben was at Bleak House Books at the time and um, published uh, Blood of the Lamb in 2004, came down for the launch party at the prison, and uh, we've been fast friends ever since, and that's, that's uh, we've got a decade under our belts, over over a decade now, that's really cool. But, yeah, actually, it yeah. probably was about, about 10 years ago right now yeah. that everything was going on. Yeah, yeah, a good time, I was trying to think about how many different books we've worked on together, both at... Um, Bleak House and Tyrus. Um, it's been it's been a it's been a handful at least. I and, think of five different projects that you and I have teamed up on yeah. in some capacity. Yeah. Well, I uh, would like to for you just first of all to tell us a little bit about yourself and you know what you how long you've been in publishing and I know you you started with a media company that was broader than that and then I think you've narrowed the focus into publishing and then been in a couple of different houses and are one of the most successful indie publishers in the in the world in the history of indie independent publishing houses I think um, but anyway tell it give us, give us a little bit about your yourself your as, journey as you, mentioned, as you mentioned the original publishing genesis in my life was Bleak House Books a company that I created with a friend of mine back in about the year 2000 and we did mystery, crime fiction, mystery including Blood of the Lamb. And then in 2005, Bleak House Books was purchased by a larger company called Big Earth Publishing. And I continued with Bleak House from 2005 to 2009. In 2009, I left there to start Tyrus Books. And basically, the type of books that we did remained the same. One of the early books, of course, was Your Double Exposure. Was one of the, It was the second book that Tyrus put out. And we continued to do literary and crime and a, and a blend of those. If you're familiar with Michael's work, you're familiar with the kind of stuff that we, we like to do. And, and you, that was 2009, and then Tyrus was purchased, oh. right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I guess I kind of left out that part. So in 2011, Tyrus was acquired by F and W Media, who in the, in our circles is probably best known for Writer's Digest magazine. And F and W acquired Tyrus, and that's been three years now. And we've continued to do the same kinds of things. Some of the highlights in that time period were Scott O'Connor's novel, Untouchable, was a Barnes & Noble Discover Award winner for fiction. And we've worked with uh, Morgan Freeman and John Grisham when we did Delta Blues. You had a story, of course, in that, in that anthology as well. And it's just been plugging along. And, of course, the industry has changed a lot in 14 years. And I think it's expected that all industries change over time. But I think that publishing has undergone an accelerated change, especially as ebooks and digital reading have become so much more prominent in the landscape. Well, I definitely want to get into that and, and how you have evolved in what you're doing as the industry has evolved, as publishing and, and that kind of thing has evolved. Um, evolved. Tell me about F&W a little bit more, though, the company, and you're, you remain the publisher of Tyrus. Yeah, is that I'm right? Publisher of Tyrus. Yeah, F and W is a is a much larger uh, by many magnitude media company that um, that has a, a, I guess actually content company is what is what it's now being pushed as. But for enthusiasts, for people who are into a wide variety of lifestyle things like. Uh, hunting, crafting, quilting, writing, all of those things um, were just a very, very tiny part of F&W. But you, you have maintained your autonomy in running Tyrus, even in this larger company. Yeah, I've, 
I've maintained editorial control. I still need to be able to justify projects uh, based on numbers as far as potential sales, what the sales history of an author is that we can see on places like BookScan to get a, to get a good idea of how much we can expect to sell of an author's book. Um, but from an editorial standpoint, yeah, I've main, maintained control. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so why don't you tell me just a little bit about the changes you've witnessed? And I know the in the last few years, the those changes have changed. You know, exponentially, the 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 speed at which things are changing has increased. But I'm sure from 2000, the last 14 years, you've seen any number of changes. But how has it changed, and how has it changed what you're doing and the way you do it? Well, I think the obvious thing is that ebooks have become much more prominent. And 14 years ago, there were certainly ebooks in existence, but it was a smaller market. Um, it was something that was regarded with some skepticism that people weren't going to want to read on screens after reading on screens all day. The technology caught up and made it a, a more enjoyable experience for some people. Some people still very much favor paper and actually want to hold it, and it's a tactile experience. And that's one thing that I think has come out in the wash over time is that uh, people read for different reasons. People enjoy the reading process for different reasons, and for some people it's about consuming material and wanting to have a thousand books on one device. That's, that's one thing. And other people have those more unqualifiable things, like they enjoy... Having them, having them on their shelves? Is that? They is have that? It up on their shelves. They got a big collection. Got a big collection like that. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's all about uh, the paper still, and I think in those the sweet spot where ebooks were exploding initially, there was a lot of talk about paper books being doomed, and they were going to be relics, to antiques, and no one was going to read that way. And I think that. You know, the data changes on a daily basis, and depending on what source you get it from. And there are a lot of people who have different agendas when it comes to all of this stuff. But I think uh, non controversial data would suggest that ebooks have definitely claimed their share of the market, but they've plateaued a little bit in that it's not just continuing to destroy the print book. And there are a lot of people who speak loudly and very self-assuredly that they know how things are going to change right. and that they know the future. In the cases, they don't. And, and if you hear someone telling you this is the future and they, and they lay out some case and in your gut you say, I don't know if that sounds right, it's okay to listen to your gut and acknowledge that things aren't. From an editorial uh, point of view, it hasn't really the, – the explosion of ebooks hasn't really changed – what I'm looking for, what I do, I believe fundamentally in the beauty of a novel's ability to connect reader and author to human beings. Uh, we read because we don't want to feel alone. We read because we want to be heard. We write because we want to be heard. And we write because we don't want to feel alone. And regardless of delivery vehicle, <clears throat> that is essential to what for me makes a good novel and that's what I'm always looking for and that hasn't changed right right I mean that's that's why we do art I mean we're, we're it is about connection and and of course creativity and and expression but more than anything else it is connecting and um, right. and that doesn't change do you when you publish a book when you choose a book are you doing four formats are you doing hardcover paperback audio and ebook on pretty much everything you're doing or uh, we're doing it, it's we're still trying to find that sweet spot right now we're doing hardcover and simultaneous e release there is some talk of going back to doing hardcover paper and e which is what we had been doing historically and we've been licensing the audiobook rights out to third party companies and, and so we're letting them handle all of that part of it so where you used to do uh, way back in, in Bleak House days and even leading into Tyrus, you would do hardcover and a trade paperback simultaneous release where you would be catering to collectors and library markets with the hardcover, correct? And then your general reader with, with paperback. 
now you're doing the hardcover for, I assume, library and, and collectors. And then your ebooks have taken the place of you doing trade paperbacks? I think in some respect, yeah. I, I think, again, we're still trying to figure out what exactly the reading preferences are there and how you manage consumer expectations with the need for also generating enough revenue to keep operations going and and you want as many people to be as happy with the choices that they have as you can and you need to also just have practical business considerations being made too do you do any strictly ebooks and and if so are you able to experiment try things that you couldn't buy you know by having a, a large print run for a hardcover we haven't yet, but it's definitely something that I imagine will happen in 2015. It's something I'm excited about because there are projects that have definite enthusiast uh, markets for them, but those markets can sometimes be pretty slim. And you want to give people really meaningful and really powerful books. And if the audience on some of those might only be 500 or 1,000 people, it, it may not be practical to do a hardcover of it, but because of the cost efficiencies of being able to do something digitally, it, it may make sense to do that, mm. and it's certainly something that I would explore. Right now, uh, how many books are you publishing a year, and, and are you open to people sending you things, or where, where are you in terms of submissions? Uh, we're publishing between 8 and 12 new front list titles a year. We're getting most of those books are coming in from agents. We do have an open submission policy that's on our website, tyrusbooks.com slash submissions. We've got it spelled out pretty clearly what we're looking for and what we're not looking for. It's it's possible to still get things in that way, but I would say that most of what we have coming in is is from <clears throat> agents that we know and who understand us. Right. Excellent. So tell me about you. Tell me about your... Um, what got you into publishing or into this, into, you know, media, story, music, whatever got you in the first place? And then for 14 years, what has kept you here? And are you honestly as excited today about what you're doing as you have been or when you first started or all the way through? You know, are you... Um, do you get weary doing what you're doing? I mean, where, where are you? Tell me a little bit about your journey and evolution and, and then, you know, where you are in the, in the process. Wow. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I got into it because I am both obsessed with words, but also fascinated by stories of human beings living lives, triumphing, where they collapse, where they get back up. And in the book world, there is a steady stream of that coming through. And we can read it and, and get our dose of inspiration or insight or any of those things that are, are critical to living a full life. My enthusiasm for people's stories and for the written word and for communication and that connection is greater than it's ever been. It, it continues to burn and it continues to grow deeper. There are times when the immediacy of, of human interaction like this, or if we were to meet somebody on a corner somewhere, is more gratifying to me than having to go through the larger process of production and, and all of those things, which in their own way are fun and are very meaningful and, mm. and very give a lot of purpose to things. We're living in pretty chaotic times, and I'm always asking how can we as people best serve the world in as immediate and as large of impact as possible. And I never underestimate the value of literature to do that. Mm. But I may get pulled in, in other directions while I'm still doing it. Mm. 
What about your personal reading? When you're running a company like you are, and you're reading submissions, and you're reading, um, you know, not just new submissions, but new books from authors that you've been publishing forever, what kind of time do you have to read? You know, is do you have any? Are you are you able to? Do you, do you fight for that? Do you? And then if so, what what are, what do you read? And yeah. I read a lot of nonfiction. We we do only fiction. I read a lot of nonfiction, and sometimes that's book length. Sometimes that's long essays. That changes. I it it happens, but it's rare that I read a full novel these days of something other than what we're publishing. Most recently, I read Lean on Pete by Willie Vlaton which is an excellent book that I encourage people to go read. But I, I also spend a lot of time, and this is in no small measure because of the relationship I've had with you. I spend a lot of my time reading different religious and philosophical texts. Excuse me. I, I uh, reread a lot of, of those books, and I try to find different insights that are present in more than one and try to understand how to integrate that and those things into my life and back to that, that larger mission that we were talking about. I read a lot. I'm, I'm, I am constantly consuming new information and new material. Novels within the crime fiction world is not what is getting a lot of my time when it comes to recreational reading. You're, um, do you have to fight for that for, for your reading time, you're talking about you read a lot, but what, what percentage are you um, reading for work, you know, and what percentage are you, do you, in a given day, if you've read a lot at work, do you tend to read less at night or, or you know, on, on your time? Do you use oh, yeah. audiobooks? I know you travel oh, a lot. Yeah, I was about to say, I shift over to audiobooks, and when it's done with the work day and I want to go on a walk or I want to go on a drive or do anything different that doesn't involve sitting at a screen and reading I'll definitely throw on audiobooks and I will I will listen to audiobooks and if I like something I might listen to it two or three times to make sure that I, I feel I don't know if there's science behind it but I feel like I consume a little bit less of a book if I listen to it compared to when I'm reading it, and I think that's because I am usually doing another activity and momentary distractions. I might miss a page or two of what was just being read to me. I'll go back and listen to those books multiple times just to make sure that I that I picked up everything there was to pick up. Audiobooks have proven to me to be a, a, a very helpful way for me to keep consuming to keep consuming books. When I was mentioning Willie Flotton's Lean on Pete, that one I read as a paper book. The, the History of Love is another book that I read in, in paper, but I've I've got a bunch of biographies and I listen to those as audio books. I've got more of those religious and philosophical texts that I'll listen to as audio books. That's, that's basically how I'm, how I'm consuming it's, it's interesting you say that about the retention and, and actually what you're getting from the experience. I saw recently a study said that you actually are getting less reading an ebook than you are the equivalent book on paper. I think it's marginally different, but it's still different. And same thing for audio. I think it depends on the person and how you process information. You know, I'm very auditory and I've always loved audiobooks. And feel like I get a lot out of them. But in addition to all of that, the truth that you just touched on is the second time you read something is really the first. You know, the second time you see something is really the first. You're you're you get so much more out of it. And if something was worth reading, I think it is worth rereading. If something was worth watching, if something's you know, that you are gonna get so much more out of it doing it that way, taking that approach. Sure, and you can definitely see 
bits of foreshadowing that you wouldn't have noticed the first time that you're like, oh, that was clever the way that, that was put in there. And, and you can see more of the artistry behind the project when you are a little bit more familiar with the landscape. So tell me, um, what, how does a writer, and let's, I'm going to ask you, but I'm hoping it will sort of apply to a lot of publishers and editors, but how does a writer wow you? How, how, what, what, what happens uh, when you receive a manuscript from an agent or you open a book and you, and what is it that you takes it to another level for you and causes you to say, Ooh, this is why I read, you know, this is, this is the reason I'm doing this. Voice is really important to me. I want to know that someone is being original and that they're following their gut. A lot of times I will see projects that are, rehashes of TV shows, movies. You can see that someone is posturing and trying to sound like something else. That doesn't work for me. That that kind of disqualifies it. So when I hear an original voice, when I think, man, if I met that person on the street, I would immediately want to hear this person's story and this person's experience. That's a huge thing for me. And it's, when you read enough submissions, and I don't mean that anyone is infallible at this, but when you read enough submissions, you can usually tell in the first couple pages, sometimes the first couple paragraphs, whether something is going to grab you and hold on to you or if it's just not for you. Mm. And, and most of the time that ends up being not for me. And that's not always the case if it's a bad book. It's just not right. for me. But I can tell that pretty fast. I And our guidelines specifically lay it out, but I don't like stories about the cop who's just about to retire or the international badass who knows 15 different martial arts and can shoot you with his eyes closed. Like, I, I, that doesn't do anything for me. I, I want to know that a regular human being gets thrown into an extraordinary circumstance and using the resources that I have or my neighbor has or you have that we could take on this challenge. And we might come out totally beaten up for it, scarred for it, but that, that – the human will inherent in us all is what gets us through those situations. And I want to see that reflected on the page. Excellent. That's not always a happy ending. Sometimes that's just a limping off to the sunset. Right. Can you, do you know, are you able to tell us what <clears throat> percentage your books are selling hardcover versus ebook? You know, are they, is it 50 50, 60 40, 70 30? Do you have any data or idea? As, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any meaningful data that would be worth drawing any conclusions from. One, I try not to actually look that closely. I just try to get the books out. And if I start thinking too much about one over the other, it's just going to stress me out. And there are often very few, if, if no, ways for me to really move the needle short of maybe making a book a flash sale for you know, 99 cents or $1.99 as an ebook, But then that skews the data in a way that I wouldn't be able to just throw out a meaningful, a meaningful number. I know that both do well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, I appreciate our friendship and, and love you very much and, and have enjoyed our decade-long relationship now uh, and one of the things that I've been following recently is a new project a recent project of yours going on I guess about a year or more now called be local everywhere and I wondered if you would share about that we just share anything you want to out of your heart and uh, let people know about it and and uh, but I really appreciate what you're doing thanks buddy and I love you too and um, I, I echo back everything that you said be Local Everywhere came from the last few years being blessed to be around a lot of really cool people online who, when the conversation turned to helping others, a lot of people are really excited to help others however they can. And last holiday season, a bunch of people put together a list of items that they had at their house that were new or like new 
that they were willing to part with. And we compiled that list and then made it public for people who maybe didn't have the financial resources to get gifts for others or to get gifts for themselves, just to have something. And it was a really cool coming together of people helping other people out. And the people receiving things were grateful, but the people who were able to send things and to help brighten someone's day, those people also had some pretty moving experiences. And I got flooded with emails and letters from people on both sides of it. And it was this really beautiful thing. And I thought, this is great to do online. And that's a very legitimate way of connecting people is using the internet. But I'd also like to go out and see people and mm. see people's experiences and, and be a part of their worlds in a real life, tangible kind of way. And, and I hate saying the word real life because that diminishes the online experience, which is just as real life, but I guess I mean in the flesh. And then I decided there were a couple of other things that happened late last year, but I decided that I wanted to do volunteer work in all 50 states in 2014 and that I wanted to go and see some of the people who I had met during the holiday stuff, again, on both sides. And I have spent time this year working towards that goal of all 50 states in 2014 and, you know, having to also run Tyrus on top of that. And I've got uh, a boss and the structured FNW has been very supportive and, and very encouraging. They're very big on community. So that's, it, it fits right in with their core values. And I have seen a lot of the country and I've seen a lot of people who are very enthusiastically and very determined to tackle different issues that are facing their communities, that are facing all of our communities. And it's a beautiful thing to see. We're, we're bombarded daily with such negative news about what's going on in the world. And it would be hard if you, if you looked at the TV or if you looked out your window to not feel like we're in dangerous times and everyone is out to get us. But I don't think that's reality. I think right. that there is a lot of love and there is a lot of compassion in the world. And we have to do something to make that louder than the negativity. And we have to live our lives with love, not fear. And the best way of doing that is getting rid of all of the false divides along you know, countries and races and religions and all of these things that can be very important parts of our lives, but that don't need to exclude us from experiencing other parts of people's lives and, and other worlds that will help create a richer tapestry of our own life. And uh, that's, that's basically what the project has been about. And I've been so blessed to meet so many wonderful and helpful and supportive people who are doing a lot of really great things in the world and there's a there's a piece of scripture Galatians 6 9 where uh, where Paul is talking about like you can't let the weariness get to you you need to just keep going because the mission is is bigger and stronger and you just have to keep going like you cannot get weary and I think we need to remind ourselves of that all the time that, uh, yeah, things are tough, but like we as people, we as a species, we as a, as beings can overcome those challenges if we just put our shoulders to the wheel and do it. And that's not being naive and saying, well, that's all it takes is just a positive attitude, right. but, but understanding our capabilities and understanding the possibilities and, and being willing to do those things to make a better world come through, we are able to do it. Hmm. So tell me today's date and how many states have you been in so far? Today's date is September 15th, 2014, and I've been in about 36 states wow. so far. 
Wow. Yeah. And how's it yeah. looking to complete the goal before oh, end of the year? I'll do it. Yeah. No, yeah. no question. I'll do it. No, no question. Excellent. I'll do it. I've got, I've got, um, they're, they're left in clusters. The remaining states are left in different clusters. And I don't know exactly when I'm going to get out and do them, but I know that uh, I have the strategy laid out for how to do them. And, uh, I've preemptively reached out to different charity organizations to say, hey, and volunteer organizations to say, hey, I don't know when exactly, but this is what I'm doing. I'm going to be in your area sometime before the end of the year. And I'll get people saying, okay, you know, just let us know when you're coming through and we'll make space for you. So it's, right. it's been pretty awesome. Excellent. You're so right. There, There is so much to be done. And some people in a very jaded, cynical way, say, because the challenges are so great, you know, globally, and because we're so aware of the global challenges in ways that we never have been before, we're not, you know, the even the, your concept of being local everywhere, I mean, we really are these days because of communication and transportation and all the changes. And so because they're, you know, so large and uh, on scale, so many people say, well, there's nothing I can do, nothing that will really make a difference, you know, um, and the, the, that's wrong. I mean, the truth is we can all make the world a better place today. There's, you know, it, the ripple effect of doing good. There's nothing that feels better than doing good and helping others. Nothing. And there's right. nothing that is better. You know, nothing has a better impact on the world. And it's uh, it's a great thing you're doing. And I certainly uh, appreciate you would you uh share with us the website and uh how people can find out about it and and what they might do to help sure the website is b b e local everywhere.com and to help you know it's not even a structured it's not even a structured charity so i'm not even going to hit people up for donations or anything like that just go out and do good in the world go volunteer somewhere go do a random act of kindness wherever you can. Like Michael said, it's a totally, uh, the ripple effect is there. It's a contagious thing. When you do good, it inspires in you a, an urge to do more of it, and it also inspires those people around you to do it. Just, we can be better. I think there's a whole lot of people who want to do good, who want to help, and, and, and a lot of times when they have the feeling of, oh, I would like to do more, there's a... There's a certain um, fault sense of, well, I've done something because I had that feeling or had that thought. I really want to do something, but there's no opportunity or I'm, I would be embarrassed or I don't know. And so I think a lot of people who want to do something are hesitant, hold back. And I think what you're doing is helping people with that, saying, you know, there's there's so many things you can do and you don't have to travel the states. You don't have you have to, you know, go next door to your neighbor's house go down the street, you will encounter people who are in need. There's so many things you can do. And, and, you know, money or work is the least of it. You know, there's just so many positive things, uh, you know, a smile, a friendship, a kind word, listening, letting someone feel heard and understood. We can all do that every single day. But what you're doing gives people an opportunity. It, it, you're showing them how to do it and how you can go into a strange city, foreign place, it's not your home, it's not your, and you find somewhere to help, somewhere to volunteer, something to do, well, then there's no question that we can each do that in our hometowns, right around the corner. Right. Agreed, 100%. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing. Now, you do you also you have a blog that people can read what you're up to and your thoughts and things, too? Yeah, BenjaminLeroy.com. Okay. So give me both of those again. The the be local everywhere dot com and benjaminleroy.com. Thank you so much. Love you, brother. Love you too, man. Take care. Bye. You too.